Opportunity to be dismissed uh, before the business meeting. If you'd like to come and worship and go home before the business meeting, uh, be here at six o'clock, and we'll give you an opportunity to be dismissed before the uh, business meeting. And some of you had asked about a Christmas card list. There's one laying on the table <laughs> in the foyer. Uh, Mr. Donald Duncan got that together for us last night, so you can. Uh, if you want to give some Christmas cards out, uh, the box is actually in the foyer that you can stick those in. You don't have to put postage stamps on them, just stick them in. Um, the cubby hole is there if you want to bring them next Sunday. And uh, we'll probably leave that up until after the first of the year and let you uh, put the Christmas cards in. And those of you that are here, check them every Sunday and get those that belong to you out. I forgot to announce that a little bit earlier. If you will, open your Bibles to Genesis uh, chapter 3. And uh, we're going to be talking again about uh, Christmas and the uh, birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm going to preach from Genesis to Galatians. Uh, so you may need to have a turkey leg stuck in your back part pocket uh, this morning by the time I get from Genesis to uh, Galatians, you may be hungry before we get there, but uh, uh, this is a, another, God made uh, Satan a promise in uh, the book of Genesis, and uh, I think uh, when we get to the book of uh, Galatians, it gets really, really, really exciting. I hope you get as excited about it as I did as I studied it. Uh, because it's all about the Christmas season. It had to begin at the Christmas season. Uh, and I really, really love uh, to think about what Christmas is really all about. Uh, because uh, God promised Satan something. If you can comfortably stand, I won't get right on the end of the scripture. If you can comfortably stand, do so. If you can't, feel free to remain seated. I'm going to read verses 14 and 15 out of Genesis chapter 3. So the Lord God said to the serpent, and this is after they have sinned and done all of their sinning, God's laying down all of it. He's talking to the serpent first. He said, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go. You shall eat dust all the days of your life. But here's the key verse. Verse 15, he said, I'll put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit to prepare your heart for his word this morning. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this time of worship this morning. And God, I pray for your presence, for the presence of your Holy Spirit to move in among us. Help us to fight the battle with Satan, to keep our minds focused upon you, upon your word. Total submission to you this morning because Satan's going to be here fighting with us, trying to get our minds, our thoughts, off on something else, not listening to the word. God, it's not because I'm here, but it's because it's your word and it's because we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about God. We're reading what God said, not what Copper Spring said or what Gary Burton said, but this is God's word. So would you just take your holy presence, bring a calmness among us, let us fight, let us bring every thought captive unto you. 
that we submit every thought to you and just uh, take your word and uh, Father for those that are Christians rejoice in the battle that you fought and uh, God uh, just see how in control that you really are how defeated that Satan really is and uh, let us rejoice in that if there's someone here that don't know Jesus <coughs> if there's someone here that's struggling with Satan feels that Satan has the upper hand let them see in your word today that uh, Satan never has the upper hand when it comes to you. Uh, and let them fight that victory today through the power of the Holy Spirit and uh, leave uh, with victory in Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus. Pray for someone lost today that don't know you. I pray that they would uh, be uh, drawn by the Holy Spirit of God, that God would call their name, uh, that they'd be saved before this service is over and they'd come into a personal relationship with you that uh, they would know what it would be to be uh, free of the bondage of sin and to know you in a personal way before the service comes to an end. Ask all of this in the precious holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is, uh, all of you know the story, but God had everything in order. Everything was perfect. In the garden. Uh, Adam and Eve, God had their thing going. In the cool of the day, Adam and Eve and God had their time, had their alone time, had their time to commune. Uh, there was no sin. The serpent came upon the scene, and I'm just going to briefly, because y'all all know it as well as I do, but he briefly came to Eve and he said, have you ever looked at that fruit right there? He began a conversation with her and engaged her in a conversation with him. And she began to look at that fruit that she'd been around all of this time. And I don't know how much time that is. But he got her engaged in a conversation. And the scripture said that she began to look at that fruit and look at it in a different respect than she'd ever looked at it before. And it began to look good to her. Uh, even though she saw it many times before, and she decided that, yeah, it looks good, and I think I want to eat of it, and we all know the story. She ate of the fruit. She gave it to Adam, and Adam ate of the fruit, and then that day when God came into the garden, they ran and hid because there was sin in the garden. So God called all three parties together, and he said, I've got something that I'm going to hand down. There's going to be punishment because Satan, the serpent, has caused you, has led you, not forced you, but he led you into temptation and you seen it. So the first one that he handed down was to the serpent. And the thing that he said to him in verse 14, he said, God said to the serpent, because you have done this, what did he do? He went into the garden and he tempted Eve and Eve fell for the temptation. And she not only fell for the temptation, but she gave it to Adam also. And Adam fell for the temptation. And Adam was one that actually got the orders from God. So Adam knew that he should not be eating of it. So don't blame it all on Eve because Adam knew very well that he didn't have any business eating of that fruit. So he said, because you've done this, you're cursed more than all of the cattle. So you're not even going to be able to walk and keep your head up and walk around like cows and the other animals on four feet. But he said, more than every beast of the field, on your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust. So the serpent today still crawls around on its belly and has to suck the dust because it's down on the ground and it can't even get up like a cow does and stand at least three or four foot above and graze on the, the grass and all of that kind of stuff. He said that's part of your punishment that you're going to have. But let's look at verse 15 because I want to go from there over into Galatians because he said I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. Because see, it was the woman that he went and tempted and got her to eat of the fruit first and then to go give Adam the fruit. And she gave him the fruit and he ate. He said, I'm going to put some enmity between you and the woman. You got her to, to give in to your temptation. Well, I'm going to make you pay for that. 
I'm going to put some enmity between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed. She's going to produce and she's going to have, and you'll find that the woman is going to start producing children and there's going to be pain in children. And that's going to be part of her uh, punishment and she's going to have to be in subjection to her husband. That's part of her punishment. We, we're not going to read all of that. But he said between your seed and her seed, and now look, I want you to remember this phrase right here when we go to Galatians. He said, he, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There's going to come a day that between your seed and her seed, there's going to be enmity. There's going to be a warfare going on between your seed and her seed all of this time. There's going to be a warfare going on. But there's going to come a day that he'll bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What in the world is he talking about? He made a statement. I believe it was a promise that he made to Satan that day. There's coming a day, Satan, that there's going to be that you're going to get your head bruised and all you can do is bruise the heel. You're going to make some pain. You're going to make some agony. But your head is going to get crushed. And he was referring to Christmas Day. Now you say, well, was he referring to Christmas Day or was he referring to the cross? I think he was referring to all of it. Though. Because you can't have any of it without all of it. Could Jesus have ever died on the cross if he had never been born? No, he couldn't have. That's the reason I think we ought to get up on the 25th day of December and say, praise God, hallelujah, for Jesus Christ being born through the virgin birth of, Jesus, of, of Mary on this earth because if he had never been born, he would have never died on the cross of Calvary and every one of us would never have saw this verse fulfilled. The bruising of the head of Satan would never have occurred if Jesus Christ had never been born. Amen. Amen. But how many celebrate it in every other way except praise God that Jesus Christ was born on earth? Let's go to Galatians chapter 4. This gets exciting. Galatians chapter 4, we're going to start with verse 1. We look at this and it says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is a master of all. Verse, let's go ahead and read verse 2. But is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Now you really have to go back and read the Roman culture to understand verse 1 and 2 because he said in verse 1 that He's an heir as long as he's a child, but he does not differ from a slave, though he is a master of all. Now, that, that just seems like it's a total contradiction there because he said he's an heir as long as he's a child, but he does not differ from a slave, though he's a master of all. It just almost seems like he's contradicting himself phrase after phrase after phrase, but he's not. He's saying as long as he's a child... Now, verse 2 explains that. He said he's under guardians and stewards. If you go back and read the Roman culture, they had guardians and they had stewards and they had someone to look after them. And the, the age that they used back then was age 25. And you had to be at the age of 25 before you could actually get your inheritance that belonged to you. And up until age 25, you had these stewards uh, that watched over all of your inheritance and they, they did what they wanted to with the inheritance. They had these guardians that put you in the school and taught you and raised you and taught you all of the rules and the regulations and taught you how to be a man or how, taught you how to do the things around the farm and all of that. And they had these guardians and all of that that was appointed by the father. And But, but you still couldn't just take this and sell it and do what you wanted to because you were still a minor in their opinion until you reached the age of 25. You didn't have that to belong to you as up to that time. 
But let's go to verse 3. Even so we. Now, there's a lot of controversy as to who we is. I think he was talking about the Jews and the Gentiles both. I think he wanted to include everybody here. Even so we, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now, he's comparing that bondage to when they were a child or a minor, when they were under restrictions as a child and a minor, and they couldn't, they, did, they, they were restricted. They couldn't sell part of the farm. They really were still like a slave. They had to do what their guardian, they had to do what they were told to do, and they, they had no right to sell they, they were just like a slave until they reached 25. And then the, the dad, the owner, the father said, okay, it's yours at that time. But up until that time, they were in bondage just like a slave. Even so we, Jew and Gentile, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Do you realize that every one of you and I we're under bondage of sin at one time. Sometimes we need to think back to that. I think sometimes we've been saved so long that we don't think we ever sinned. I think we've been saved so long that we don't think we really needed a Savior. We've, done, we've already paid for our price of being a sinner. We've sang enough songs, we've read enough Bible, we've taught enough classes that we've paid our price for all of that. No, we had a debt that we could not pay. We owed a debt that we could not pay. And we need to realize that. And we need to give honor and glory to God for sending his son. And here's where it's going to really get good. Look at verse 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, <laughs> December 25th, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. That's what Christmas is. It's not all about what gift that I can buy and make sure that my grandkids, my wife, my husband is pleased and I got them exactly what they wanted. And when the day's over, we can sit back and say, boy, I could tell by the expression on their face, that's what they wanted. I cooked them their favorite pie. I cooked them their favorite meal. And I, I can tell by the button on the center of their shirt, it was about to pop off. I could tell that they had ate all they could eat. That's what Christmas is all about. No, that's not what Christmas is all about. Christmas is all about when the fullness of time had come. Amen. You know how long it had been as best I could find, and I tried to connect the dots because there was a lot of different opinions on this. But from the time that I read you Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, to Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, had been about 4,000 years. But that's when Father God said, it's time for Jesus to come to earth. And I sat there and thought about that as I read that this week, and I've read it over and over and over and over and over again, and I've cried and I've shouted and I've, I've done everything you can think of on this because this is exciting stuff to me. But I thought, why did he not wait till the mid-1900s? He could have got it on the Internet. Instead of Jesus being in a stable down there and having to send shepherds out of the field and them having to go back and travel all of this time. He could have had it on the internet, broadcast across the TV and all of that kind of stuff. If he had waited a little bit longer, he could have got it on Facebook and everybody done on it in just a little while. But God had a purpose, didn't he? Amen. He had a timing. He wanted them old stinky shepherds that was over there in the field with a bunch of sheep. And if you think 
that they were dressed up, took a shower, took a bath, put on nice smelling cologne before they went to see Jesus. I don't believe you can find that in Scripture. <laughs> but they went over and found Jesus and got all excited about it. And they went back and started telling other people about Jesus. And he said, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman. That's something that is so hard for me to comprehend. Is for the man Jesus to leave heaven, come through the birth canal of the Virgin Mary, and come down here on the face of this earth in a trough that a cow eats out of. To save somebody like you and I from their sin said he was born under the law. Amen. Amen. Let's look at verse 5. Why was he born under the law? To redeem those who were under the law. That humbled me so much. To think about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to leave heaven, to come through a woman, to the face of this earth, under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. And it just keeps building and building and building and getting more exciting and exciting and exciting. He not only wanted to redeem me from being under the law, but that we might receive the adoption as sons. Amen. Amen. Praise God. That's what Christmas is about. It don't matter whether I get anything to eat on the 25th day of December or not. I'm going to celebrate Jesus Amen. if I'm living and breathing. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not, I'll celebrate him anyway. I'll be there with him. Amen. 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 But how has the world got today where we're at today? When we take the X take Christ out of Christmas and put Xmas on all of the windows. You can't walk in Walmart and say Merry Christmas. They're not allowed to do that. When a man came to redeem us out from under the law and not only just to redeem us but he did it so that we might receive the adoption <coughs> As a son of our Heavenly Father. Can he get any better? Yeah, it does. Let's look at verse 6. And because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of, in, of his son into your heart. Crying out, Abba, Father. I tried to study that, and a lot of people said that's just saying Daddy. But as best I can understand, that Abba, Father, from the Greek, and I'm not a Greek scholar, never claimed to be, but that is the most precious, dearest, statement with the most intimate relationship that you can say in the Greek. And we walk around sometimes like God is light years away from us somewhere. 
And God said, I took December 25th, and I'm using that because that's what's marked on our calendar. God said, I'm using December 25th to send my son to redeem you out from under the law and to adopt you as my sons and daughters. And because you are my sons and you are my daughter, I have sent forth the spirit of my son and, and into your heart that you can give me the dearest, closest, intimate relationship that you can call me Abba, Father. You have that right. You can come that close to me. He said in the book of Hebrews, come into the throne room of grace boldly. Don't come in like you're scared of me. Don't come in like you're afraid of me. Don't come in like you don't belong here. Come in boldly. You're my child. I sent my son for you. That's what Christmas Day is all about. Look at verse 7. Therefore you are no longer a slave. but a son, and if you're a son, then you're an heir of God through Christ. I don't know whether you got this message this morning or not, but if I don't light your fire, it can't be lit. Amen. Amen. Because of that one man and that one day that God said at that appointed time, Jesus, through the Virgin Mary, go to earth. He came here. He started his life. Was that the end of it? No. We all know the story. 33 years later, he died on the cross. <coughs> Three days later, he res was rose from the dead. God brought him out of the tomb. <coughs> Some 40 or 50 days later, he ascended into heaven. And today, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. Through Amen. Him. But if he had not come through on Christmas Day, where would we be today? Mm. Not good. <coughs> Celebrate Christmas. Think of what Jesus did. Where would we be today? He messed things up in the garden, didn't he? They had it perfect until he went and talked to Eve. And Eve kept looking at that fruit. And for some reason, that particular day, it looked better than it ever had it before. Just because of listening to Satan. And Satan said the reason God don't want you to eat is because he knows that you'll be as smart as he is if you eat of it. She said, well, I believe I'll try it. When God calls the serpent over, he said, there'll come a day. There'll come a day that your head's going to get squished. And he started that day rolling. When Jesus Christ came through the birth canal of Mary and hit Mother Earth. That day started rolling. Let's celebrate Christmas. The way Christmas ought to be celebrated. Amen. That's it, amen. Musicians, would you come? spoke to you today 